trickling in after a, a few minutes here. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Joel Silverman. And um, Joel, while I share this, do you want to give a quick little intro of, of who you are and where you're at and, and what you're all about? <laughs> what am I all about? Um, I, uh, real brief, I've done this so many times, so I'll do this in about two minutes. I grew up in Southern California. Um, my parents were both teachers and I lived in the LA area. We used to go to SeaWorld when I was a kid. So we go every summer. And um, I was fascinated with the marine mammal trainers. And, you know, I was like eight years old, nine, 12, you know, 12, 13. When I became 14, 15, I was like, you know, I kind of like to be a killer whale trainer. I used to watch killer whale. I was just fascinated with him. And um, so I had a dog I was training at home. It was like a 13, I was 13 years old, I was training a little dog. So I was, I was kind of already training this dog. And then, you know, so I come, you know, 14, 15, 16, I want to be a trainer. And they're like, I go to the park operations, I go to the uh, personnel department. They were like, well, at the time they were hiring people for trainers that work in the park. So if you work in park operations, you pick up trash, whatever, those are the people they hired, you know? I so uh, I'm, I graduated early from high school. I had enough credit, credit, credit to graduate early. I graduated early in my 12th grade year, my senior year, to move down to SeaWorld to go pick up trash. And I always tell people at my seminars, uh, how many kids do you know that you would, your kids, you know, want to graduate from high school to go pick up trash to, you know, to achieve their dream? And my parents never, ever balked at it. They were like, you know what? And they backed me 100%. I thank them so much for that. So I go down there. And um, so I went through that and um, just bugged the director of training constantly and just bugged him over and over again. And um, at the time I was pretty young. And so he had told me about this college called Moorpark College. It's a, they have an exotic animal training management program, Edom. And they only take 30 people every year. It's a very, very exclusive um, um, program, but it's, but it's out of Moorpark Junior College in the Simi Valley. And so they recommended me. I went through the program for two years, Moorpark College, and um, went, you know, when I left Moorpark College, I started, there's somebody I knew that I started doing the animal show at Universal Studios real briefly, but then I went back down to SeaWorld and I was at SeaWorld for another like four years. Um, left there, SeaWorld came, left SeaWorld and I worked for a company where we contracted dolphin shows across the United States. At the time we were doing like like 13 dolphin shows, all the Six Flags parks. We did okay. all the Six Flags parks and I did a lot of coordination of that um, with, another, with some other people. We transported dolphins and things like that. Um, which is very stressful. And so, um, and then uh, came back to doing show at Universal Studios. That's what got me doing training animals for movies and commercials. Um, and then, you know, did a lot of movies and stuff, which we'll talk about in a, you know, today. And, but um, one of the things I did was um, I was doing a TV series, Empty Nest. I trained Dreyfus, who was a spinoff of Golden Girls. Closest thing you can get to a full-time job because it, uh, it was like four years, um, four of the best years of my life. You're on a top 10 show. You're treated great, you know, great you know, just a great cast and everything like that. But when I was, what happened was because of my, you know, uh, performing in theme parks and stuff like that, because I did dolphin shows also at Magic Mountain. I put the dolphin show in Knott's Berry Farm in Southern California and then Universal Studios in SeaWorld. So I did shows in all the theme parks in Southern California, except Disneyland. And so um, just my experience and so what happened was in between scenes, we shoot in front of a live audience, empty nest. And there's an audience like three, I don't know if you guys have been to tapings before. There's like three there and so they got a wardrobe changes well they would bring me out with a microphone and i would work bear i would talk to bear and they would answer answer questions and stuff like that bear was play, play the part of Dreyfus, and i'd work him and stuff like that and i do them and i take questions well at the end of one of the things these people were going hey man we want to do a dog training video and we want you to do our video for us we were just coming to the end of the season we we're just going on hiatus and i went to april i went in april i flew out to um salt lake city to do the video it's called the hollywood dog training program you guys may have, if you just google it you'll see it on ebay um it's when i actually had hair and um it, it we sold a half a million it was an infomercial it was we sold a half a million of those and that's really what got me into doing stuff on camera because it really really taught me that because i would come up to people and they would be like hey you know i've got your video and i really really appreciate it you make it you know easy way you break things down and things and i was only I think 29 or 30 years old when I'd done that. And um, so I did that left in, and once I, I left empty nest, started doing a bunch of other things. And about 10 years later, animal planet contacted me to do a show called good dog. You and animal planet just had started. And it's when Steve Irwin crocodile hunter, he just had started his thing a couple of years back on animal planet. And they brought me in to do good dog. You, which was, um, ended up being one of the highest rated shows on Animal Planet within the first six months. We were doing like Train Your Dog Day with Joel Silverman, all these eight, eight hours, you know, 16 episodes back to back and everything. And 
we did that and um that was really and that was really enjoyable and then um um but uh so i did that and then uh, i guess 10 years later do another tv series called what colors your dog was syndicated tv series and then um right about that time right about in probably in the mid 2000s i decided to you know really about maybe 20 years ago the last movie i did was a movie called a good year with russell crowe really really scott directed it we shot it in france and i brought this jack russell i had trained sunshine the name is sunshine it's a really great dog really great time by the way that was the last feature i ever worked on it was 2025. what was it called good year a, a good year yeah a good year yeah it was a great movie it was fun it was in we shot that in southern france in bonio and so um that was and at, right about that time I started writing, you know, books and I started wanting to write this What Colors Your Dog book. And so we wrote that, uh, you know, we wrote another, you know, follow up book to that. And then there you go. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, did that one and then um, did a bunch of other, a couple other ones. And I did another newest one called Rituals, which is my, which is my, my, fav my favorite one. But, really? um, but yeah. And so I really wanted to get out and start teaching people. And I really, I think what it was is I, I kind of had a little bit of a, chip on my shoulder because what happens is when people see you on tv they don't take you seriously they think that you're just an actor or they think and especially with good dog you they were just thought that you know because they they put me in like i know i know the wardrobe people like they like when we, when the day that we were like okay here's the wardrobe and they had a hotel room and they had me try on this word stuff that i don't wear stuff i wouldn't wear normally of course but, um you know you're wearing this wardrobe and stuff and it's just like it's just not who you are really but so people think that you're an actor and you're not a trainer. And I am a trainer. I, mean, I have a passion for teaching people. I always have. And so, um, so we did the show. And for some reason, I don't know what it was, but after the first season, it was the highest rated show when, on weekends next to Crocodile Hunter. And after the first season, they decided to go with somebody else. And um, somebody at the upper echelon did not like me. And I have no idea why they did it. And it just, it, I mean, I could have been there, you know, Milan. I could have been there, Caesar Milan, you know, because like this is before him long before him yeah uh, they decided to go with somebody else and i mean people would come up to me like for the next year they're like who's this other guy why did you leave this i didn't leave it. it wasn't my decision it was their decision to, to not do it so um you know, it was kind of a bummer that was that was really really kind of a bummer because that could have that could have been something pretty big um but everything happens for a reason that's right and so, um so yeah so i started i started writing the books um and then i launched these dog tra a dog trainer certification course uh about seven years ago, my smile certification course certified about 450 people where I go to dog daycare businesses or I'll go to dog trainers and, you know, certify five to 10 people at a time. Cause I really believe that it should be done hands-on. It's a very, very aggressive, you know, five day course where we take, you know, four untrained dogs, sit, stay, lie down, come heel, go to a place like train, you know, um, and um, so that we, we started doing that. And then what ended up happening was I was speaking four years ago at the IACP and I met Jay and I met Larry and then I met those guys and I was speaking and I told my wife, I came back and I was like, well, Larry, I knew who he was. Cause I, cause I talk about him in my, um, my classes because I play one of his videos, his e-collar videos of the Rottweiler because I love the video. It's just, it's the way I do it. And, um, and then Jay, I had not known my friend, Amy Sadler had introduced me to Jay at the time there. And I met Jay and we started talking probably four or five times. And I was like, oh, this guy's really, really cool never saw him speak. Okay. I never saw his deal. I never saw him speak, never saw his delivery, never saw him, the way he talks, you know, but I was <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's really funny. So I come back to my wife. I'm like, I'm going to do something with these guys. So sure enough, you know, Larry and I did something together later on that year. And then after that year, that one Tucson one that we did that year, I told Larry, I was like, you know, I want to bring this Jay in. I would like to bring him in. And, um, you know, so we brought him in and, uh, it was, it was in St. Louis of like, I think it was almost four years ago now. Because this for this St. Louis will be our fourth one. So it'll be the very, did so you one. did you meet at the ICP at St. Louis or Florida? Which, which we, one? Did we you met at the ICP in Colorado Springs in four years. Oh, four I was years there too, ago. man. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, well, that's how long ago. And then we met them. So that's when we met, and um, it was just it was really really cool. And you know, I I mean, it's I, I put this thing together. I run everything for my corporation. I told those guys. I said, listen, I'll run everything. And um, to this day, you know, we we probably have what I think eight to nine hundred people a year come to our events. And um, it's just, it's just enjoyable. I, I know you interviewed Larry recently. I wasn't sure if Larry talked much about this, but we really, oh, yeah, he did. We, we love it. You know, we've become really good friends and um, it's just, um, it's just a blast. So that's kind of what we do. That's kind of what I do now. And um, that's kind of my deal. 
Well, and Larry talks about, man, when you have thousands of people coming across you with their dogs in, in this little short span of time, you know, you see certain aspects of the condition of the relationship with the dog and the and the person, right? And he started talking about different cases that would come forward. And some people are never going to get it, right? Some people are, are, it's like a weird, it's what they think that it's such um like a protocol thing, right? And they're always looking for that secret to the technique or or what is behind this that's making you do this and not realizing that it's all about the relationship. And then on the flip side, he sees the people that come in that are golden, that are worried that they that they have something missing. And then when he sees them working their dogs, I mean, people are flabbergasted that the the, the enthusiasm that this dog is showing and love that and the connection that these people have. And, and so it's, it's like a spectrum that you see with the relationships of, and, and it is interspecies communication, right? And that's what's so cool about what you do is like, look, you've, you've not just done the dog thing. You've done the, um, the killer whales and the dolphins and, and um, other, other, have you worked with other, besides marine life, um, any other? I've worked with, I've worked with wolves um, as well. Wow. I've worked with wolves, yeah, because the company, I um, there was a place where we were volunteering when I was going through work for college, actually, they did, um, they did um, a lot of wolf work. Um, they did the movie The Guardian. Uh, they did their wolves. They, they did, um, they had a that pack of like, I think, you know, and the company I was partners with, actually, um, uh, another company I was partners with did, did a Never Cry Wolf movie, Never Cry Wolf as well. That was their, those are their wolves. So I've got a chance to work with wolves as well. And uh, very, very, you know, very, very different, the dogs. But, you know, something you said that is really important to, and to the day I die, you know, everybody knows my story. I tell people in all my books, the relationship and bond is everything. And something that Larry touched on, and this is something when, you know, um, whether Jay's working with somebody or I'm working with somebody or Larry's working with somebody, a lot of times we see people come to our events that are actually pretty good trainers and they have really good intentions, but it's business. And like with the dog, it's all business. It's yeah. not like, let's just stop and let's just kneel down and let's just engage with the dog. And if the dog wants to lick us and put its feet on our shoulder and just get in our face, let's just take our time and not put a time limit on it. Let's just let the dog bond with us and let the dog develop that relationship. And we see so many times, so many times the people that come that just, it's like business, you know, they're very, very good. And it's not a knock on people that come because they are good people. They're absolutely, they love their dogs. The people that come to our events love their dogs and it's just great. But the one thing I guess my point is, is that so many people, when we take the time and just tell the person that, can you just like stop? And just don't do anything. You're a good trainer. You're really, really good. But just engage with your dog. And I remember there was a there was a, a guy at one of our events. Um, and he had a shepherd, and it was just man, work, work, work. And a good guy. Not not work. Not not a hard of ass. Course. But, he was, but he. And it's like I just said, man, if he just slows down, if the guy just slows down and just engages with the dog. And sure enough, you know, Larry he was. I think Larry was working with him and stuff like that. And by the so by Sunday so much better so much better and it's a quick fix i mean it really is a quick fix i mean i wish you had, i tell people all the time they come to our events you know i said they're working with their dog and i said i wish everybody had that problem i said you're a good trainer you, you, you you've done the hard part you yeah. know the easy part is just i said it's just the relationship you just got to stop engage with your dog develop the bond develop that relationship but you're absolutely correct well, and they're showing up. They want to learn, and they're eager to understand this in the deeper level, right? Instead of, and and, and um, I think that it's a lot of times too. It's a lot of our personal programming too. Yeah. We, what we come into this relationship with, and and uh, maybe it's a controller, maybe it's um, a higher maintenance dog that you have, or, or like a working breed, or something that that people just don't know what they don't know. And then once they find out, look, like this is this is something that doesn't need to be controlled. Like this is something that needs to be experienced. Yeah. Right. Yes. And one of the things that Larry, Jay and I, I mean, and, and, and again, you know, people that come to our events, we always say, Hey, you know, three different styles here, through. but we're really alike in a lot of ways. And, you know, aside from the fact that we, none of us have hair, um, that's one of the things, but we are very similar in a lot of ways. And one of the things that we all talk, all three of us talk about in all of our styles, is let 
<clears throat> let the dog fail. Do not yes. be afraid to let the dog fail. Let the dog fail so the dog can make choices based on the failure, you know, and stuff. And then a good example, the most most basic example that everybody could relate to, and I always use this in, at the events. I probably say this every time. I would, I said, you have a dog on an elevated area. You need to train your dog to jump up on something elevated. You're going to train your dog to stay. And I said, you know, the, the elevated area is you know this high. It's you know four inches high, and you're going to start stepping back. And you're going to, you know, just, you give a dog a treat just for staying there and staying there while the dog is staying there for you know ten or fifteen seconds. We don't move back. We start stepping back. We probably have an idea that. Once or twice, dog is going to, maybe even three or four times, dog is going to, you know, jump off the thing. But if your intention is to basically, if it jumps off, say, hey, right back again. I don't say no. Don't say, uh -uh. don't say, you know, nuts. Just bring it out back. It's like when a dog sits and let you make that decision. So you sit, sit, stay. I'm going to step back. I'm not going to put my hand. You know, I tell people, is my hand right here. People put their hand like two feet in front of their body. And I'm like, and they make like they're making the dog stay there. I'm like, and I tell my, I tell the t boys it's like, if your dog wants to break, it's going to break. Your hand being 10 feet in front, two feet in front of you is not going to help. Matter of fact, right. it's going to make it more confusing. But mm -hmm. I'm like, your attitude and your body language should be, hey, listen, you know, and pretend like he's been staying for 10 years, 10 years. You know, it's like, just take that one or two steps back. But the, when, he, when you take that two steps back and he stays there, now you walk in and reward the dog for staying and let him figure out, it's like, hey, if I stay, I get rewarded. If I jump off, you know, they're just going to bring me right back up again. And if the food means something to the dog, I mean, it's true positive reinforcement. If the food, food means something to the dog and that thing by teaching people that, 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 that those types of things that allows people from the very beginning to make those decisions, to let the dog make the decisions instead of, instead of, and a good, another good example with that elevated area, what we see a lot of people do too is you and we guide the dog up. What a lot of people take, do is I don't have my hand here. My, they'll take the leash and they'll, pull the dog along with the food, right? They'll lure, but they'll pull the dog. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I tell people, you're not allowing the dog to make the decision. I would tell people, drop the leash. Just drop the leash. Don't allow, don't allow the food to be that thing, not, not your, because if you're guiding him up there and he jumps, starts jumping, and he's, and he's balking, whatever, you work it out. But if you, if you take him and you start correcting him and just make him come up there, even lightly, you're not giving him the decision to do, allow him to make that decision for himself. Because that's going to create that really, really good attitude. Instead of worrying about it, it's like, oh, I'm going to stop because I just know they're going to go and correct me and make me come up there and stuff like that. It's like, well, is that the way you want to train that behavior? I mean, you could do it, but is that the way you really, really want to do it? That's my style. Well, and it's, it's, it, I tell people like it, 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 it's akin to finding your way using landmarks and the Rand McNally Atlas versus having the GPS directing you every single where to go. Right. Yes. And once your phone dies, guess what? You're lost, man. Mm -hmm. So you rely on that too much where when you find it using the landmarks, you're like, Oh, I remember that. I know exactly where I am. That's right? a great, that's a great analogy. Actually, that's a really good analogy. But it takes frustration. It you takes a podcast. Oh, you do. <laughs> What's that? It's like you should have a podcast. I said, "Oh, you do." <laughs> oh, yeah, I, do. <laughs> I should. You know, that's a good idea. No, um, but it takes frustration. It takes work. It takes sometimes mm -hmm. failing. Sometimes we get lost, and then we go. We have to backtrack and be like, "Okay, now I, I kind of know where I'm at. I saw this." And guess what? When you fail, when you go down that road that you know is the wrong road, you're not going down that road again, right? And so yeah. that's the other aspect about failure, not just with the relationship with the dog, but in our aspects of life with business, mm -hmm. with, you yeah. know, failure is actually a good thing. And they're, one of my favorite sayings, Joel, is fail harder, right? <laughs> like, don't yeah. let failure knock you down. Let failure build you up because now yeah. you know more than you did before you started on this conquest. No, absolutely correct. And I and people see me and I always tell people at my event, the events too, you know, they've seen the shows, they've seen the books, they've seen this and so I said, I, you know, I failed like 90% of the time. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I have. I failed like I'm an entrepreneur. I failed 90% of what I've done. I've been, I'm a failure, you know, but all you need is 10%, you know, to, to, to happen. And, uh, you know, and you could be, you know, successful, but you have to be afraid. It, besides, that's a really, really good point. But I think what it is, is people sometimes, and this is where um, the takeaway that I like to have is, is to give people that confidence. And it's like, if you have that confidence in yourself and going, you know, I'm really dog here. I'm going to step back. He's probably going to jump off. He jumps off and get bring him right back again. If you have that mentality, that's what you want. And rather than going, I'm going to make him stay here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make him. It's like, don't worry about that. Let him start. Now, down the road, 
that's for training. Now down the road, once the dog is trained to stay, lie down and stay for, you know, you train it for two or, you know, you can tell them to lie down, make them lie down, tell them to stay, stay there. You know, you can add, and you know, it's this, it's a style that I, you know, I've always used positive reinforcement to train behaviors, use treats and stuff like that. As dog starts understanding the behavior, we start fading out the treats and just making the dog, making a statement, hey, lie down, lie down, whatever, you fade out the treat and it's done. So treats are just like I tell people, it's like treats are like a drug. You know, if you don't get off the drug, it's a bad thing. And you, the treats are great to train the dog with, but you need to be able to phase out the treat. Same thing with the word no. You know, there are people, or stay, even stay. There are a lot of people who say, well, I use an intermittent, intermittent stay. And I'm like, well, that's great there, but it's never going to get you anywhere as a movie animal trainer. And I'm like, they're like, why? I'm like, well, if you train your dog to sit up, put your head up, head down on your side, all those behaviors, you need to have a, you need to have some sort of intermittent marker, which basically is right in the middle of the space that tells you're doing a great job, but you need to, you need, you need, but you're not done. You stay in behavior. Not, stay in yeah. the behavior. In the behavior, yeah. And and a lot of people say a lot of people will try to use. Um, they'll try to use. Oh, was it good or yeah? I can't remember. Yes or good, whatever. One, one mm -hmm. of them. One of them is I think good is basically is that the is that the continuum? What's the continuum one? Yeah, good, 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 good is and then yes is click but relief. The problem or, with good is when you're doing on your side, head down, or or head down or on your side when you're saying good, the dog wants to. It, it, it's too much. It's too much. What I like about I, what I like with stay is stay is like, hey, I want you to stay there. You did a great job. You're standing. You're not going to get anything, but I need you to stay there. That's what I like about that because it keeps the dog. It really keeps the dog in that position. Head down, stay. Head up, stay. On your side, stay. But again, the stay, it's like a crutch. If you don't get off this, or it's like a drug. If you don't get off it, you know, then um, that's a bad thing. It's, it's so like I tell people, it's like you know, we can say stay, but eventually we get off the stay. And I use it just like I use, you know. Just, just like I use treats. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, start fading them out. And it just because um, we're not being insistent at the beginning doesn't mean that we won't eventually insist that this happens, right? It's something that once the dog has proven that they know, and if anybody has any questions, put them in the comments here and we'll, we'll get to the comment section here in a little bit. Um, but this is great, man. And that that's that's awesome about the, the release and versus the, the stay in behavior, but it's it's like... Yeah, my, and, and my release, my not to interrupt, but my release is okay. Okay, we're all okay. And I pet the, I love petting the dog. I teach all my clients pet the dog, make it a big deal. Okay, if the dog does not hear okay, we are not done. For movies and commercials, especially when I'm on the set, and you, if you were dogs on the set, you you know too. You know, a lot of times when you put the dog, you know, you have him lie down there, and he's got to jump you know, on action. He's got to go up. He's got to go pick something up, go to the actor, draw the actor, then go over that way. He's got like five or six things that you've trained over the course of like three days for him to do over the course of like two minutes. And he's got to work horizontally and you can't talk. You know, it's just like, boom, boom, boom. You're sending him. And, um, but so we're ready to go. He already knows what to do. Uh, um, so I'm lie down. So what I'll do a lot of times is while the camera's rolling, because let's say before they, before they actually say action, it might be 15 seconds to maybe 45 seconds. I'll be lie down. That's a good boy. Very, very good. Good boy. I'll just say, and I'm just letting him know you're doing a great job. He's wagging his tail. He's having a good time. Good job. Very, very good. You're doing awesome. Good boy. And that's just my community. Much affirmation. Let me do a good job. And he knows what's happening. And that helps him get going to do his thing. Go, good boy. Go. You stay there. You stay there. Good boy. And when they, on action, it's action ready. Stay. Okay. It's like, boom. And it, now he just knows. Now he's not going to, but that's, that to me, that being able to, to, to be able to say good and have that relation and talk to the dog, that's like a really, really big thing where we're not necessarily in the word saying the word good, but we're saying, good boy, you're doing a great job. Everything is good. Now I can use good as a marker. I will use good as my marker when I'm training behaviors and stuff too. But, um, but that's kind of how we do, like to do it. Now, I remember watching you way back in 2010 at the ICP in Hutto, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, and you had, I believe it was this dog on the cover here. Yeah. Foster, that, my little guy. Yeah. Yeah. Your little guy. And, and you did, um, a presentation with the mailbox to go right. and get the mail out of the mailbox, put it in the mailbox and then flip up the, the flag. Yeah. Right. So, and I remember you talking about chaining and back chaining. Mm -hmm. it, it, can you, can you explain that? Because as we're talking about the, getting in front of the camera, do you, how, which direction do you go with the commands and introduce what the dog exactly needs to do? And how do you, how does that work? That's a great question. And a lot of people, if people don't know what back chaining is back chaining basically is training something, a, a chain of behaviors in reverse. And people will say, um, for the mailbox, for example, okay. Um, I'll give the dog, uh, the letter he'll run across the stage. He'll run like, you know, 40 feet over 
and there's a mailbox, right? And he opens the door of the mailbox. He puts the thing inside. If you guys go to my um, YouTube page, you see Duchess doing it. My uh, new the don't uh, for the Chase commercial. That was the other. Sure, I, I can do it really quick. Yeah. I, I want to say because we can explain why we're talking. It's actually my, yeah, for my TV show too as well. But um, so you want to show it or are you gonna? Yeah, I'll, I'm just pulling it up right now. So okay. if Joe Silverman, um, I think it'd be good to have a little illustrator joe silverman um is it on your joe silverman channel companions oh, for life or is that is, yeah it would be what would i search for what would be advanced oh my gosh uh <laughs> mailbox it, maybe under advanced behaviors i think it's under advanced behavior or something like that um because it's a it's the beginning of the advanced behavior segment um that's it's the beginning because of uh, foster actually does that we have at the beginning of every one of the segments he has his little mailbox thing that he does here, i'll just show you what i'm looking at here well first off let me show you everybody what joel looks like with hair <laughs> there we go. that was it, that was it. Sorry, I I know, it's funny all right so here we are well there's i guess biden's talking about something so are these any of these you no this isn't it's you not, it's not me. no it's not me right oh, here that's... So let's oh, see. Okay. So maybe playlists. Uh, no, let's see under videos. Oh. Um, Duchess. Oh, Duchess. Oh, Duchess. Wait, Duchess. It's the one with Duchess. Yeah, play the one with Duchess. That's the one. Okay. Every time you assume the camera, you fast forward. Um, oh yeah, you fast forward a little bit. That's that's okay. me working Duchess, uh, and then you'll see because fast forward, you'll see her do the mailbox thing towards the end. Let's go all the way to the end there. This is good stuff, actually, me working her. I mean, she's like, she's, this is her work away. Yeah, she's, oh, here we go. I wonder if I can, yeah, I can zoom in a little bit here. Good. All right. This is from. So where's the mailbox at? I don't see it. This mailbox is right here, but she actually, she's doing what's called the work away, which is, I'm giving all her cues from oh. the there's the mailbox right there. Yes, I see. All it. Are from me. This is pretty cool, though. This is the work away behavior, which is pretty cool. Stan. Beautiful. The stuff we used to do. Yeah, there you go. That's good. Okay, now she did the mailbox. Now she'll get it. Okay. So there's the letter. Put it down. There we go. Okay, cool. That's yeah. So that's training that with the, all, all my dogs. Yeah, and that's like I'm glad you. I'm glad we saw that. That's cool. <laughs> okay, so that behavior is giving the letter to the dog, going over the mailbox, putting his feet up on the mailbox, opening the door, placing it inside, slamming the door, putting the flag up. Okay, so people always say, you know, their their first reaction is like, okay, I'm going to go train the dog to go put his feet up there on the thing. Well, actually, what we like to do first is train the dog to put the flag up. OK, because that's the last thing that happens. So if you're training this behavior, it's going to happen. Let's say it's going to be it's going to take you a week to train the behavior. OK, so if you start on a Monday and you finish on the next Monday from the first Monday on, she's getting rewarded for that last behavior, which is because you want the last behavior to be the strongest. OK, which is the flag. Okay, that's what you want. You always want the last behavior to be strong. So then they've got the flag. Everything is good. OK, cool. And the next thing you want to do is to, is to slam the door. So we train the dog to nudge something and slam the door. So we train her to nudge it. So once the, to nudge the flag, she nudges the flag up. Everything is good. Come back to me, get rewarded. Now I want you to nudge. We put the door here. I want you to nudge the door. She'll nudge the door shut, slam it. As soon as it slams, boom, reward her. So the dog, the slamming of the door is actually what the dog sound. That means that that, that teaches the dog that it's like, I'm going to get a payoff for that. Okay. So you want that teaches that because you the sound of the door slamming the audience loves it you know they love that slam that sound so so we say nudge somebody say nudge it boom then nudge the flag so we now train those two behaviors she comes over and gets rewarded and the next step would be to train the dog to place something inside there so we train that's a whole different thing tracing the out behavior we take a little a little something small and we train the dog to place um the envelope in a little dish we train it on a little dish on the ground but then we take the dish, we put the dish inside the mailbox. So she has to put her head inside the mailbox to get inside that dish. Okay. Over and over again, eventually fade out the dish. Just so now it just goes in the mailbox. So once it goes in the mailbox, then it goes in the mailbox, boom, nudge the door, nudge the flag, boom, get rewarded. And then we, um, 
And then the next step would be to have her um, open the door. Okay, so now she's already there with the thing in her mouth. She opens the door, places it inside, shuts the door, puts the thing up. And then the next step would be to actually give her the mailbox. She runs up there. Okay, she runs up the thing, puts her feet up, opens the door, and then you know does the whole thing. And that's how. But that's back chaining, and that's and. But it's important to do it in reverse, and that's the whole point. Right, and you also have like so. Do you get a script of like, and then you kind of have to engineer it. You kind of have to. This is so cool, man. You know, and I remember seeing that, and I was just like, this is blowing my mind. I'll always remember that because it's like it, it's counterintuitive, right? Because mm -hmm. you, and, yeah. As well, yeah, mean. well, you know, it's, it is when I when I was on Empty Nest, especially now, if you're shooting on and it's a little different now because they are shooting with multi cameras, even on features. But back in the day, it was always easier on a feature because they were shooting with one camera and they always had to cut and they were going to go to here and they'll go to what's called coverage. And OK, we do tight shots of the dog. Well, if you're doing tight shots of the dog, um, you normally can do what's called MOS, which is a mid out sound, meaning there's no sound. If there's no sound, you have way more control as a dog okay. trainer. OK, that means you could talk to the dog. So um, but so in the old days, it was one camera. We're like, OK, we're going to do this. And now we're going to cut. So even if the dog in the wide shot is not as good, it doesn't matter because they're going to be cutting to the tighter shots. Now they shoot with like four cameras like and their cameras are like 20 feet away. And now there is no coverage at all. You can't they shoot everything like in like one deal. So it's, it's a lot more challenging. Again, I haven't spent a lot of time on the set in the last probably 10 years. I've done a lot, way less work. But from what they say, a lot of, I have a lot of friends that still work on the set. And it's, it's just a lot more challenging. Um, so, but in the answer to your question, you know, you get a script and they're going to give you a script. They're going to tell you what the, what the action is. And some of the things might be stuff that you, I mean, there are people that, my, my really good friend, Steve Barons did I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith. That was his German Shepherd. He got that dog as a rescue dog because the director wanted a dog that looked this frail, you know, German Shepherd. So Rich uh, or Steve had to go and find this kind of frail looking yellowish, you know, black Shepherd. And at, her name is uh, Abby. And he trained her for um, to work with Will Smith. And I mean, he worked that dog, I think I think it was six months. I mean, it's six months of like you got pages of the script and you're training all the different things. And so you train all this stuff. And then that day, you know, on the day you're like, OK, here's what I do this day. And here's what I do this day. And here's this scene. And the biggest mistake you get we all fall into is you have a tough scene at the end of the day and you know your dog is doing other scenes throughout the day some easier scenes but you're worried about the last scene but you screw up the easy scenes because you're worried about the last scene so i always tell all the new people it's like i don't care what it is at the end of the last scene is focus on the one scene at a time get that scene and let the cards fall where they may and then you go and you'll have the time to work that last scene you've been training it anyways um, and so, but just do it that way that rather than just getting so caught. And I've done that before. You know? Yeah. Where you just get so intimidated by the main event yeah, that it, that it just kind of overtakes all the little things that, mm -hmm. that are, are and uh, the devil's in the details, man. Like you have to have everything, uh, as a whole, instead of just focusing on that, that main aspect, it makes mm -hmm. sense to me. I think I met Steve. Um, did he do the golden for the, um, what was the little puppy show what Disney had with all the golden retrievers? The did he work with Disney? Do you know? Uh, he he does stuff with Disney periodically. Um, he did okay. um, he did a golden retriever. He did um, Click with he does all Adam Sandler's movies. Do you guys see Click? You see Click? Yeah, yeah, with the remote. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That was okay. uh, but he's he does all Adam Sandler's movies. Golden Buddies, does, I think, uh, or something. Yeah, he does. He has a golden. He, he had a golden. That was a long time ago, but um. But yeah, no, he's a, he, but he stayed, he stayed in the business. He's a really good friend of mine. But he stayed in the business and working, and I, where I kind of um, backed off a little bit and stuff. So, yeah, um, that's that's wild, man. And then also, the with with the last behavior being the strongest, that's that makes sense too about about, about like focusing at the end as well for human beings. I think because yeah. you want to get through this project and it gives you drive. It gives you drive to finish. You know that that last thing. And here's the deal. And for chaining behavior, and I talk about this in, um, I talk about this in all my books, predict predictability. I, and I specifically talk about it in uh, bond with your heart, train with your brain. It was a book that I, it was, it talked about Marine mammal training and the, and the, it talks about, you know, the best teachers, managers, and supervisors I've ever, I've ever met were simply nice people. The best animal trainers I've met were simply nice people. And mm -hmm. it talks about the similarities and things, things that you can do. And it talks about predictability and, and, but with predictability, 
and anybody that knows me knows I'm all about you know being unpredictable because <laughs> when you train the dog to do the the male vax gag and it's seven or eight behaviors and if you only reward the end of the behavior predict you become predictable you're going to get a breakdown of other behaviors in other um, parts of the behavior that's why we stand predictable so when we're rehearsing we always reward certain points of it at certain times so the dog never knows what it's going to get you know reward great great point because they'll blow through the rest of it or do it half-assed right because they want to get that. yeah i've seen it and i've seen that too with people um that that rely only on purely positives like i've seen them where um they they treat the behavior and then the dog will go into this manic like doing everything they know right or mm -hmm. something like that like it's not defined um and that's where as a trainer as a beginning trainer that's where i because i wanted to be this guy that only did purely positive that never really corrected a dog to do the feel good stuff for me um and then i was like wow this dog is out of his mind like and and so that that's another aspect of it of them blowing through just to get to the reward of being predictable and yeah. um and like that intermittent reward that we talk about with um uh, what's his name? The 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 doctor with the the monkeys and the uh, the slot machines, right? Have you do you know what I'm talking about, Joel? <laughs> the monkeys and slot machine. I'd like to see it. What is it? Yeah, that? yeah. Somebody put put in the comments what I'm talking about because it's the doctor with the slot machines, and it basically talks about intermittent reward, or it's a doctor with the oh, the, the light. Oh my Maybe goodness. Comments, no, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll do the last one because I read your comments here. Sorry. Okay, yeah, I'll put them up on the screen so they'll be. Oh, big, no, big I got them. I got them here. I just didn't them listed here. Okay, hello, Joe. Some, some new Newfoundland, um, Canada. Hey, you guys, let me know in the comments where you're from too. I love seeing because we reach worldwide, um, and it's so cool to see that. There's my beautiful wife right there, by the way. Um, and we'll be back uh, in a season. Hi, fellas. If you compete in dog sports, you fail very often. But if you are smart, you learn from it. Thank you, Jackie. And Jackie is one of my uh, supporters on Patreon. And while I th think about this Patreon, let me put up a, a link to uh, my Patreon page. If you guys like what I'm doing, I have some. I have a, a interview with Omar Van Mueller on there. That's only for the Patreon subscribers, and also a lot of supplemental little interviews that I do on the Patreon. You can support me for I as worked, little. Bit. I worked with Omar. The first time I worked with Omar as a movie animal trainer, because he does movie work, um, he and I worked together. He and I worked together in, and you're going to laugh at this. I always tell people the story. So I'd never met it before. And um, we, this is this is 1999 or 2000. Okay. And we needed a humping dog, dog to hump on cue. And people have trained dogs to hump on cue. He had this, he had this Jack Russell who was trained to hump on cue. And oh, home. Hump, H-U-M-P, okay. <laughs> and that's and to, to uh, hump, literally hump your leg. And it's, it's it was, it, anyway, it was great. Guy comes in, I never met him before. And it was like, boom, dog hump on cue. It was like, perfect. It's like, and it's just so funny. The audience, watching the crew is like, because the, the crew is like in hysterics, you know, because the folks just like go crazy, you know, and stuff. And they just, but they train on cue. They train dogs to do it on cue. And you know what? It's hard to find a dog that can do that on cue like that. But he'll come on. The guy will come on. Okay, bring in the, bring in the humping dog. And it's like, it's like, you bring humping dog. Boom, action, boom, boom, cut. Thank you very much. You know, he's out of there in like two minutes. I've been, I'm there for like 12 hours. He's there for like two minutes, you know, with his, you know, one dog. But it was, it was funny. It was the first time I met Omar, actually. I got to ask him about the humping on cue, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, because now I'm thinking, how the hell do you get it? You got to capture the dog. Like it's the all, dog. Oh my gosh, no, it's all to, totally that way. Absolutely. He has to offer the behavior, right? And then yeah. you, you would re reward it and then let him. Yeah. It's like, it's like a sneeze. It's like a yawn. You know, we train dogs to sneeze on cue, we train dogs to yawn on cue. Those are all things that you can just capture the behavior and stuff like that. But the problem with capturing a behavior is that, and I tell people this all the time in my certification courses, the good news about capturing a behavior is there's a shortcut. It is a shortcut. Okay. Okay. And the bad news about capturing behaviors is it's a shortcut because if there is ever a breakdown of behavior, guess what? There are no steps. And anybody knows about me, I'm all about seven steps in every behavior. There's always steps to, you know, seven, eight steps. There is nothing. If you train your dog to lie down on cue, or I mean, every time your dog lies down, boom, you click and the dog does it. And then you, you're you like, oh, great. He just plopped down. I'm going to put it on cue. You could say lie down. You can just, you could have a nice little mellow. Everything is great. Nice little easy cue. Dog lies down. You're like, great. My dog lies down. You've been doing it for two years. And let's say 
you got to bring your dog into Universal Studios at stage 28, or 12 o'clock at night, you know, or 12 in the morning, you know, midnight. Dog's lying there every, on action, ready to go. All of a sudden, on action, and this happens, all of a sudden something falls down on the next set, stage over. Boom, everybody like, it's like, oh my gosh, the dog freaks out as well. The dog's like, what was that? You know, now you got to get the dog back again. Now you're going to give your dog a cue to lie down. Dog's like, no, I don't want to lie down. Where do you go? Can't go anywhere. Talk to God. You know? So, so like, how do you mitigate that? You, you, you do it with, and you generalize it, and maybe you put different things in the environment that are going to make and break, so you can be that insistent and be like, no, no, no. Well, you don't capture the behavior. The, 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 the thing is, you don't capture the behavior. And my point is, see, I train dogs to lie down from a sitting position or a standing position, but I train the dog to lie down. We train the dog to actually do it, and that's my point: is the fact that we, if you train it to do the dog to lie down, and now you have a problem. Guess what? You can go back and you can regress because there were steps involved. When you capture a behavior, there were no steps involved. That's yeah. where the problem is. And that's why I tell people all the time. It's like capturing behavior is okay. And there are certain things you have no choice but to capture. As I said, you can't, there are no steps to training a sneeze. There's no steps to training a yawn. There's no steps to training a dog to actually stretch, you know, putting that on cue that, you know, those are all things that it's just a natural thing. And so if you have no choice um, and humping is the same way and you can't train step by step. But you can train the lie down step by step. You can train the sit, sit up on your side, head up, head down, play dead, back up, bow. All those behaviors that we can do, we can do, and that's 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 the ticket. Well, I call those foundational. Like if, once we start to get into the art aspect yes. of this, then and the dogs like getting lost, then we boom right back to the foundation. Yep. And yep. let's yep. see w- w- how we can rebuild it, right? And something, you, something, something along your, your lines, it's, it's huge. Um, and I talk about the foundation all the time. Everybody is so quick to move away from the foundation. What's the foundation of the dog staying? Well, me, two feet away from the dog, get people in front of me, walking back and forth. So, you know, desensitize the dog. Desensitize the dog with you from two feet away on, on an elevated area. Make it easy for the dog. But create all that distraction early on. That's your foundation. Rather than get really super far away, get the dog on flat ground, and now the dog is still kind of like half-ass on the behavior, and now we start bringing people in. And like you just said with that foundation, if you can just build that foundation, that nucleus early on, and everybody wants to move way too fast, you know? And I always tell people, and, and they get away from that foundation. So that's a really, really good, that's a great point. Well, and it's like, and that's where the art and the science aspect comes in, right? Where just like we were speaking about with Larry and and Jay, how people come in and very, very science minded, Mm -hmm. right? Like, what's this? What's this? What do I do? And then you're introducing the art where sometimes there's people that are too art minded Mm -hmm. and don't have the solid, don't have the solid foundation, don't have that. um, They have the relationship and they have the enthusiasm. But as soon as something comes into the environment, like the, the crashing light or something that just happened now that art aspect is just through all the the science and knowledge out the window and so it's like i call it an art and a science and we have to have you know a good place to to fall back on in case that dog and i call it getting lost if they get lost in what we're trying to ask of them and then we let's get something that they know without a doubt and so then we can build it back to and maybe take like a different route to get to to where we want to go with this dog that's a good point uh, that's a really really good point real quick um i just want to just mention something just real quick um of course i should have mentioned earlier and stuff like that and people know that i tour with larry and jay and people know that jay just if i can just real briefly and just let you know and if i if i don't if i don't do it i don't want people to think that i'm not aware of it because, i mean i'm very aware of this whole thing with jay and it's just um i've been i talked to mandy a couple of days ago his wife yes that accident you guys might not know um horrible accident um uh last wednesday night um she posted information um all the information about him right now is his status and everything like that he's doing better um he was in a really tough position he's just he had some some surgery on his leg on his abdomen and um she'll get she'll read out all the information but just your your prayers for him are you're huge um if, he has a gofundme page as well that um kim barber who works with grc has put together too and um, Jay's just a great guy, and he's um, it's this has taken a major impact on me and Larry. Well, we all three have become really, really good friends, um, touring on this uh, with our workshop tour that we do for uh, almost four years now. And um, he's just a really, really good friend and good guy, and uh, just a great, just a giving person. He loves to teach people. has a, has a, has probably one of the best speakers um, I know. 
and um, it just needs it. And so, you know, with our events, we got two events where Larry and I are doing on our own uh, this December and January, but, you know, Larry and Jay will be back in June, but um, just your prayers for him. Let's talk about Jay for a second. We'll go to the comments here because you're absolutely right. I just put up a link to his GoFundMe oh. and it makes me, I've done a couple of these with Jay and dude, he's so, when I first met Jay, you guys, like I met him on the way to the IACP conference. We flew into the airport together. I think it was at St. Louis. I've met him a few times or maybe it was Florida. I don't know exactly where it was, but we, we met up at the, tr at the shuttle to the airport I mean, to, at the shuttle at the airport, we're going to the hotel together. And I recognized him from the Chad Mack and uh, dog conversations that he did. And um, <laughs> I don't know, man, I just hit it off with him. Like he's such, he kind of scared me because of his background as a fighter, you know, an MMA yeah. fighter. And I have this beard and he told me about his dad. And Jay's had, he's gone through so much in his life, man. Yeah, you know, his, his childhood was rough. Had a really rough childhood. That's what that's what really really tore me up about this yeah. happening to him. Like, dude, why? I mean, he's gone through so much in his life. Like, this was the the the, the last person that I wanted to hear this happening to. But there's, as you and I, as believers, uh, we know that there's a bigger, broader picture here. And mm -hmm. one thing that. Um, well, I'll talk about what when I first met him, I was talking about my he had a comment that his dad, his dad fought a lot. And and he talked about how he saw that his dad beat up this guy and he grabbed his beard and beat him up by holding his beard. And so I was like, dude, I've stayed arms length away from you, Jay, because I don't want you uh, oh my gosh. to beat me up, you know. And, and what a great guy, man. Ever since the very first time that I met him. And I've done some of these live streams and I've actually gone to one of his solo events when he was right. here in, in Vancouver. And I hired him privately to work with a dog that I was just it was a pity that was very reactive. Mm -hmm. And just to watch him work, man, in a private setting at a house, we had an Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely love this guy, man. Like and, um, something that I saw that really, really. I think reflects on the type of person that he is, is that GoFundMe started out at $10,000 and that, that was reached within a couple hours. And now we're approaching almost a hundred thousand dollars that people have donated to him. Wow, it's, it's just, it's amazing. And as I said, I mean, you know, you know, we're talking about before it's like um, that in life, you know, you run into certain people. One of the reasons I, I picked him to, to uh, work with Larry and I was because he just seemed like when I met him at that um, IUCP that he's a guy who just has a passion to want to teach and help people. And it's like, and that's me. That's who I am. That's what Larry is. That's you know, all three of us are that. So we just want to help people. That's it. And, you know, and we don't, we have no egos. It's like, you know, if, if, if what I'm doing doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. You know, and if you can pull a little bit of what I'm saying, that's good. You know, it doesn't really matter, but we just, we just want to help people. And Jay is that type of guy who just, but it's not only through, dog training through martial arts. I mean, when you think of the people that he's taught through martial arts and things like that too. Um, and his, as I said, he's just got a passion to want to help people. And that's what just really is just, um, is just um, um, so heartbreaking with this whole thing because, um, you know, and he, and he had, you know, he had, a, he had an issue like, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago with a uh, heart, heart, a heart issue. That's right. Yeah. I had to go off caffeine. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was like, yeah, he was drinking, like, he was drinking like six of those monster drinks a day. I'm like, is this really good for you? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it, there's you know, consequences. You know, we come, you know, come the next one is like, where's your monster drinks? Ah, I don't drink that anymore. You know that? No caffeine. No. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I remember talking to him and then I invited him to the clubhouse app, which is an audio only app that was very popular, especially during pandemic. And he would show up and, and um, I was talking to him through, all throughout that time, and he had to wear this halter monitor uh, for a month. Um, and he's been through a lot, man, but he's he perseveres. And I love his style of teaching, and especially the what, we call, what he calls the porn star. <laughs> Gee, many Christmas, Jay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The porn star teaching, like, ah, ah oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, or whatever. <laughs> he's got so many things. Oh my gosh. He's just got, he is hilarious. He's just, as I said, he's a great, 
He's a he, he's a great addition to our to our group. I'll tell you, that's all I could say. The guy's amazing. And I want everybody. I encourage you all. If you have not donated to his GoFundMe, please visit it in the comments below. He could really use our help. And and thank you very much for being there for him. He's our brother. And yeah. and if you haven't seen him, and in I, I highly highly recommend um attending one of your guys i haven't been to one of your guys i want to go yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah uh, and actually our denver is going to be the first one with him back that'll be in june in denver and we're already getting more people we had a, a lot of people sign up already but um we're getting a lot more people um sign up for denver denver is going to be a big one with him okay i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna be there as well so. you, had a, you did have a question somebody did, could you extend yes. on the difference between training and capturing behaviors again yeah, let me see here. Uh, yeah, surrender, and then um, I have one earlier too. So let me just say that real quick because I was I saw that one. I thought I thought it'd be kind of cool. Um, so yeah, so um, so my style of training is I really believe that every behavior needs to be trained step by step. Whether it's to sit, to lie down, the most basic, the heel. Every behavior, there's always you know seven to six to eight steps in every behavior, and we just and you know the border collie or the Malinois is only step one. Then step, it might well go through step one, step two, step three, all the way to step seven in like 45 seconds, you know, but the, you know, the little uh, Pekingese might be on phase one for, you know, you know, a day, you know, whatever, or, you know, not to knock on Pekingese, but the bottom line is everybody learns <laughs> at different speeds, speed, uh, speeds. And so we, we train behavior. So if we have a problem on the set, we can always regress. We can always regress. When you capture a behavior and the dog just like lies down and you click and you, you know, reward the dog for that. That's fine, but the problem is if you have a breakdown and the dog is like, in, in, not even on the set, but the dog is confused, you can't regress because there were no steps involved in training the behavior because you captured the behavior. And so, but there are some behaviors, like I was explaining to him, that, that some of the behaviors that we have no choice but capturing, like the yawn, um, uh, the sneeze, the yawn, and some of these other, bow, and some of these other, shake, like, shake. The, yeah, the, yeah, some of these things. But um, so that's the, that's, that's the point. So hopefully that, that gives you. Yeah. Now, is there any way, how do you proof the captured training? Um, well, the, the, the way you proof it is basically to, to create a lot, of, a lot of distractions and stuff. So if you're training, a good example, like um, you're going to train your dog to, uh, to, uh, to yawn. Okay. Dogs train a yawn and cue. So we train a dog to in a sterile area in our house with nothing going on. And we slowly start bringing things around the dog. And you start proofing it that way, bringing people distractions, have people come up, maybe walk by the dog, almost brush up against, like have the dog yawn after they brush up against the dog. Maybe the two people brush up against the dog, you know, little things like creating as many distractions as possible. The dog is like, okay, great. I, you know, and you find out where the dog, where's my breakdown? Where is it? Oh, you know what? He's really having a problem is that as the people come a little closer, he's not wanting to yawn. I'm going to bring the people back a little bit, work it that way, and then start bringing people in. But that's how you proof it, just like anything, really. Well, so, and I as soon as something touches that dog too, that's a, you know, that's what I've learned too. Like proximity, of course, like you're talking yep. about, but also a physical contact mm -hmm. and especially where the dog can't see it or, or maybe, you know, and, and then absolutely. And just kind of take a 30,000 foot view here and think about like, where can I go with this? And, and each dog is an individual and some dogs might have a problem with it. Some dogs might not. And but but what if what if what if you're on you know you get a, a, call, a call like a script like I get a, a lot of times you get like one page and it's and it'll be like okay I want the dog to yawn but the only thing is they want the dog to yawn but they want the person kind of petting the dog it's really important the person's petting the dog while the dog is yawning okay now we'll train it like we will train that to do you know it's going to take some time to do it but we will train now that we know what we have to do we'll train it um, but that be, and, and if that person touches it as a person's touching the dog it takes a little more time so help me i will train I mean, it's like it might be multiple sessions throughout you know whatever but um but we'll we'll definitely train the dog to do that you know so that's but but, so, but sometimes it's sometimes it's really good to be able to um sometimes it's really good to get one even if it's a challenging thing one script for one thing and look at that one page and look at it and go and it, and it doesn't happen for 30 days and you're like okay cool and it's one thing dog has it's a tough thing but i got 30 days you know and, you know, knowing myself, I'll probably train in a week, you know, <laughs> have it done. And I'll be the, I can kind of skate the next three weeks or whatever, but it's like, I'll probably be up all night training it. You know, that's, that's, that's me. How long do your training sessions typically last, Joel? 
my sessions are real and anybody knows about me knows really short my sessions are um very short i, I two uh two to four minute sessions okay. um, and then sometimes maybe 15 to 20 a day um little tiny sessions so it might be two minutes here and we let the dog just kind of chill for a minute or two and i come back in two minutes and do it again i like doing short sessions dog is like going gets it figures it out it's like whoa whoa it's over with it's like yeah we're over with it's like it's we're done uh, well wait a second i want to come back out again that's 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 the mentality rather than having the dog out there going you know i really don't really want to come back out because this isn't really fun so i always like to do a thing where the dog is out there for a couple minutes whatever understanding and then you know if, if there are times you've got a long session you're doing or dog if you are doing that you know 10 15 minute session you know down the road so be it you know but early on i like to do really really super short sessions and then do you put them in a crate before and after or do you do, um, yeah i like that? to put it well they can go in a crate they can just be away from me anywhere away from me i just don't want them to be around um <laughs> but the crate is always a good thing because especially if you do the behavior put them in a crate and then you do something else they're they're in the crate just waiting to come back out again and do the same, you know the same thing so uh but yeah Let's go to another question here. A question about teaching stand from sit. Ooh. I used a front foot target and I'm having a horrible time fading it out. I also realized probably should have used a back foot target. Should I start over? Any tips? Gina, that is a great question. Okay. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to use any target on the front foot, front feet at all, because you'll, it's, you're going to run into exactly the problem. Okay. Cause I ran into that problem probably 20 or 30 years ago, maybe 40 years ago. Um, so what you want to do is for that stand, a couple different ways to do it is, um, first of all, I like using an elevated area. So if you have something elevated, almost, even, even only, um, two to three inches, just something like that. So teach a dog on the elevated area and get the front feet on the front of it. So the dog can't come forward. Okay, so you train on the elevated area and do it that way. And then once the dog understands that on cue, pretty good. Now you can move it to flat ground. But if you um, do what you just said, if you do the mark thing, they're only thinking about the mark and you'll never, you can't get the mark out of there because you can't, because they're trained on the mark. So they're always going to be looking for that mark if you train it that way, because you've taught, you've taught them that. So what we're doing is we're just basically telling the dog to stand, but we're on an elevated area and do it that way. A um, couple different ways to do it. I always like that sometimes I'll just touch their flank. And lift their flank up, lift okay. their back legs up, or um, um, or sometimes we'll take the food, just bring the food towards you. Where is my hand like this? Bring the food towards you this way. So the so dog has got to move towards you and lift its butt up. But the big thing with that stand, the reason I like the elevated area, I like to teach the dog to pop its butt up so it doesn't cheat forward. Now, some people train it on flat ground, and when they do it, they, the dog stands and takes like a step or two forward, which is okay for them. But I just like the dog to pop its butt up. That's what I like. And the only way to do this is to do it on the elevated area. But that's a great question. So I'm I'm front foot target. What is what is I'm having a hard time like Well, what, what she's she's said is she's ta she's she's taken an, uh, a mark and she's trained the dog to stand on a mark on a target on the mark. Okay, like for example, if you train the dog to stand on a target, like it would be like a a a square a Pie square right. like this. Yeah. So it's front feet are there. The problem is is when you train that, you can train the dog to stand there, but you can't fade it out. Cause it, cause you've trained this mark. It's hard to train mark. The dog's like, where's the mark? I can't know where the mark, I know where the mark is. So, but we train the marks for a lot of different things too. We'll train the dog to go to a mark and make the mark, you know, a mark like this becomes a little leaf, a little tiny yeah. leaf like this. And so um, we can train that, but, um, but that's, that's actually a really good question because some people have tried that before and it, it almost always does not have a good ending. What I do is I, um, I'll put it in the box too. I'll start it in the box, but then, I'll I'll do the mark or not the mark, but what we call positions, where we we teach the down, the stand, and the uh, sit all in one, and where we do a tactical, where we touch the dog in a certain area and then start fading that out, and then do the vo only the voice, um, and and then start fading that out as well, and then we move into hand signals as well. Oh, great! No, that's, that's that good. No, that's great. So you do it in a box. You put the dog in a box. In a box, so it's got it's got hot uh, uh, like. Yeah, yeah. It's at first. It's right. It's kind of like here. I'll just show you the. It's like a first Schutzen or whatnot. That's where I where I found mm -hmm. it. Um, where it's just kind of limits that dog space so yeah, they can't no, really like step that. forward, yeah, right? And so, and so, um, and then and then, but it's it's work, you know. Yeah. And I used to do it with the uh, with the leash, right? But then. Uh, Bart Bellin told me, okay, now I want the dog to um, stay sitting because I would do leash pressure forward meant stand. 
right and i want you to pull on that leash with the dog staying sitting and it, and he he got my gremlin in the in the project or because then i couldn't because the dog would stand every single time i, I put any pressure on that leash and so then it was like a flank uh stand was to the flank and then i would do the pressure on the leash mm -hmm. to kind of prove that you need to stay seated seated as well so right, right? right. and so there you gotta have that's the value of working with mentors and people that can see holes in your program that makes sense so I, I do like that box the box thing that does make sense to me though i've never i've never heard that before but actually as, as i'm thinking about it it does make sense yeah it just yeah. limits their space and you fade the box out right away too yeah yeah, yeah. um you know nelson at all have you met him yes absolutely i met him i saw him and uh we were in uh one of our events we had dinner with him actually one uh one yeah, night what a, what a great guy great guy, great guy. Let me see here if we have hello, Bill and Joel. Great explanation. Oh my gosh, look who's here. Oh my god, it must be Halloween. Oh gosh. <laughs> Joel is an expert on two to three inches. Okay, Larry, I could take that so many different oh ways. What, what does he mean by that, Joel? Do you know? No, the thing is, I can't get away from you know, it's like he just <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's just, Larry just enjoying giving me all kinds of crap. It's like it's so funny, and he's like, and, and and here I am doing this thing, and it's like and there he is. He wouldn't call me by the way. He's like he called while you were. Uh, we were uh, oh, Larry, yeah. oh, here and and he should be out hunting, dude. That's where I didn't think that we'd oh, see him. You know? I think he's in a tree. He's probably in a tree right now. He can, he can be on the floor. He's in a tree. Is he in a tree? Larry, aren't you in a tree? Yeah. And when I did the live stream with, with Larry, dude, we talked about how he goes to the bathroom in a tree and he hangs his butt down like a monkey. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, not a good not a good thing. Did you know did uh, did you know also Larry and I are gonna be playing a pickleball thing? Uh, you know about that. I don't know, man. You gotta watch out for Larry. He is the most dude, he is the most competitive man or no most competitive person I know. Have you seen some of his TikToks where like I don't know how to explain it, but I could just say, just watch yourself, Joe. Oh <laughs> I think God. he'll do anything to win, man. Like, like pull all the stops out. So just be careful with and, that. Uh, yeah, well, it'll be, it'll be interesting. It'll be very, very interesting. But um, uh, yeah. no, he's uh, yeah. Is there anything, Larry? You gonna say that? Oh, say Joel is an expert on well, whatever. I'll let you know if it comes back. But I wanted to, to discuss this because I think, and I've always, I've often recommended this to people, especially people mm -hmm. with red or red or orange dogs, right? Yes. Um, and so, what is what is the color of your dog? What was your um, what was your like motivation? And okay. You guys, I put this in the link in the comments. If you're a dog trainer, this needs to be in your library. Um, and let's talk about this for a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I, I, I really, I really appreciate you <clears throat> taking the time to talk about that. Um, so what it was was, <clears throat> I had done a lot of appearances and stuff, and, and I do a lot of stuff at animal shelters and humane societies. And I see people um, adopting the wrong dog, and you know these and constantly. I saw, I remember seeing these elderly couple walk out with this dog, just oh. jack Russell out of control. They were like eighty years old, and I was just. And I remember that. I remember seeing a lot of different things. And I just said, I want to write a book that basically helps people understand really about, um, you know, Russell right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what I did was I said, um, let's just take five colors and we're going to go and we're going to put, um, we're going to make, we want to just make it easy on people so they don't understand. The closer your dog is the center of the spectrum, the easier your dog is to train. So you have a yellow dog in the middle, yellow, yellow. Then we have a, I'm going to stand my hand over here a little bit, okay, yellow. Then we have a green dog, which is going to be timid. There you go. Timid, apprehensive, okay? And then we have a blue dog, which is going to be very, very afraid, okay? So the green dog is timid, blue is very afraid. The green and blues are going to be cooler color dogs. Then we move over to the orange dog. Orange dog is going to be high strung. Red dog is off the wall. Front feet are rarely on the ground. Those are warmer color dogs. That's great. The point is you would never train a warmer color dog like a cooler color dog. The way you walk, talk, move, reward correct tools use everything you do is like night and day and one of the reasons i wanted this book to, to i wrote this book too is because i was just coming out with my my training collar my alternative training collar and it's teaching people that it's like a training collar is not for every dog a training collar is not going to be for a blue dog or a green dog or probably even a yellow dog but the orange dogs and the red dogs yes you might need a training collar and there might be different types of training collars to use and the point is is that you might be using training collar for a short period of time. You might be using it for a long period of time. But the bottom line is, is that you need to understand that every dog has a different personality. And that personality is given, you know, and that color 
can change based upon the dog. And I always talk about the greens and oranges. If you could hold that up for a second, one more time. You bet. Um, at least you go, yeah, the green. So the green and orange, okay. So that's good. That's perfect. Thanks. That's awesome. So the green and oranges make up about 80% of all dogs and animal shelters, shelters and humane wow. societies. Okay. So when you adopt that green dog or orange dog, and I, I, I give the same spiel at humane societies and animal shelters, not even dog training stuff. It's just this, you have the ability to take that dog and turn that green dog or orange dog into a yellow dog. If you socialize the dog, if you train the dog using positive reinforcement, if they get the dog out constantly around people or whatever, they have every reason to go yellow. If you take a green dog or orange dog and throw the dog in the backyard and agitate the dog, let it agitate. Don't socialize the dog. There we are. Yep. That's Duke. Um, if you don't, if you don't socialize the dog, if you don't use positive reinforcement, if you start jacking the dog up with, with, um, with um, training colors from the very beginning, you know, huge, huge corrections from the very beginning. Mm. You that that orange dog has every reason to go red. Okay, but socialize the dog, positive reinforcement, and everything like that. The orange dog has every reason. The orange dog has every reason to go yellow, and that's really what the point is. Um, the book and the cool thing about it too is it's what color is your dog at the time. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a Jack Russell, a green Jack Russell, maybe a timid Jack Russell. You work dog in the house. You're using treats, using positive reinforcement, motor motivation, working the dog. Last night, the dog killed a rabbit. Okay. And so you're going to work the dog outside in the backyard on the heel behavior because he killed a rabbit. All of a sudden, that green dog is not showing you a color green anymore. It's showing you an orange, orange dog. Okay. You work with the dog with the color he's showing you at the time, not the dog's emotional color, natural color with the color he's showing you at the time. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the follow-up to that book, which I will get you, I'll get you another one, more what colors your dog. I'm going to get you that one. Um, okay. And, uh, but more what colors your dog. And then it, the, the follow-up book just gives you a little bit more information on okay, an orange, uh, an orange leading to yellow, orange leading to red, things like that. A little bit more specifics. And is that the more what colors your dog? Is that on available on Amazon? Yeah. All my books are on Amazon. Yeah. As well. And then um, and the newest book was, um, Rituals, by the way, Rituals does have the What Colors Your Dog stuff in the first, I think it's the first or second chapter. I think we go into that, the first or second chapter. But Rituals is my newest book. It came out two years ago and it really deals with, I love fear, dealing with fear. And it helps um, you deal with fearful and, you know, dogs that are reactive over, over fear. And because um, I usually I love using um, high value treats as motivation in dealing with fear. Absolutely. And and so and then I put a, a link to the more of what color is your dog in the comments there. And then there, there's a link to rituals as well. And so what's what's rituals all about? I know you're talking about the the high call or high value for yeah. the fear. But what what was your motivation with rituals and, and so with rituals? This is a, this is a really, really cool book. Um, so with ritual, by the way, it's on it's on audio, too. You can get that one. That's the only one I have on audio. The rituals book was this. And that is that there are certain rituals that dogs will do naturally that for some reason that they as they do it those rituals that happen there are things that you want to allow them to happen and build on and there are some rituals that happen that you want to get rid of and it's it's important to understand a good example is we go into the whole thing about reactive dogs and i go through the whole thing about prey driving reactive dogs there are some people that will take a Malinois or take a dog that they want to train and do and compete with or train dog bite work, whatever. And they'll take that ritual the dog wants to, and they're going to build on that in a controlled way, but they will build on it and build and build and build and build. And we build on that particular ritual. Okay. Mm. And they can do amazing things with this dog because they've taken this dog and they've trained the dog to do that. But you might have that same dog that has a ritual of barking at people, jumping up on people, running out the front door, can't counter surfing. Those same kind of actions, but in a different situation, in a home environment, we don't want to build on those rituals. We want to eliminate those rituals, okay? So that's really what rituals is about. It's understanding about there are there's a time to get rid of, break, you know, break, it, you know, break it off at the very, very beginning. Do not allow the ritual to build, or there might be people that want to build on that ritual the dog is doing. And that's why we call that's where that, and that's the idea of rituals. And, um, and it's really understanding it's in his dealing and it's, and at the last chapter we go through dealing with like, you know, vacuum cleaners. I could the whole thing, breaking, breaking it down, how to deal with vacuum cleaners, the, you know, the, the FedEx guy coming by the UPS guy coming by and how to get rid of some of those 
behaviors but in using you know using you know treats as redirection that high value trait I love that. I call it ritualistic behavior, you know, knocking on the door, the dog loses his mind. A ritual is um, a series of actions performed in a prescribed order. Basically it's, it's, they are, and, once this happens, this happens, this happens. And, and, and on top of that, we go into the, I go to the vacuum cleaner. I tell people, it's like, I, t I go into triggers and I go to the whole, the whole trigger thing because triggers are really about having rituals happen. There are things that triggers are things that we don't see a lot of times, but the dog sees or hears. And those triggers once those happen on a regular basis, like you said, it's not the FedEx guy coming by. He heard the FedEx he heard the FedEx guy long before he came by, long before he came over here. He knew the dog, he knew the FedEx dude was coming over here. Okay, um, but the vacuum cleaner. You know, I tell people they're like, "Well, my dog, you know, Bart, he's reactive with the vacuum cleaner." It's not. It's not. The reason is is because everything is built up so much. It's like, and Jay talks about this. He has this pyramid thing. He talks mm -hmm. about. Um, he talks about this in our events. In our um, some of our events. Um, that we, it is a whole, uh, slide on it. And, um, but it just, you find that the dog just explodes. And, and so what it is, is that this particular issue with a vacuum cleaner, it's not just a vacuum cleaner moving and it's not just the vacuum cleaner being turned on and it's not just the cord coming out. Okay. Which is now three triggers. And it's not you walking downstairs with the vacuum cleaner. And it's not about you taking the vacuum cleaner out of the closet upstairs. It's probably right starts with you walking in the closet to get the vacuum cleaner, you know, and you have all these multiple triggers. And that's what basically, and by the time it comes on, Doug's like, I know it's coming on. Oh, he's taking, he's taking it downstairs. You have no idea. You don't even, you don't, you don't realize, you know, the public, well, you as dog trainers do, but the public doesn't realize the public is like going, you know, they're like, you know, why did you do it? It was like, you, the second you walked in there to get the vacuum cleaner, it's like, Oh, they're coming out now. They come out the door. Yep. Are they going downstairs? Yeah, they're going to go downstairs. They, they're plugging it in. That's <laughs> there it. we go. It's, yeah. And it's and it's endorphins that that dog experiences that are self fulfilling, self rewarding. They get this adrenaline hit from reacting that way. Exactly. And dogs watch you twenty four seven, man. And that's what I tell my clients. I'm like, they're watching. They're they're sitting there. Even my dogs that are out in that room, they're watching me in here, even though they can't see me with their eyes. And I tell people there's a little exercise to prove to you that your dog is watching you. Go put on your your shoes, go up your keys in your jacket, and go sit on the couch <laughs> <laughs> and watch what your dog does. You know, and, and, right? And and just to prove, like, yeah, your dog is aware of everything that's happening. That's we're their entertainment, I think. We, we are, and you know, one of the one of the things that taught me about animals watching me. I'm going to move over here, and that is here. I can do you. These this. killer whales, right over there, the killer whale. They sit there all, when I was working at SeaWorld, they'll yep. sit there all day long with Look their at all those. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well, there you go. Look at all those, wow, man, so you know, cool. Right uh, yeah, but um, that's, that one, yeah, that's pretty, that one right there. Yeah, that's the right jump. That's, the big guy. That's stuff when we were, we had So cool. cool. It's pretty cool over here. That's like, there, yep. Those are all, um, yeah, it's just, it's really, really, but the point is, is that, is that they're sitting there and they they're kind of in the water with their head tilted with one eye out of the water watching you and they're just floating around and you walk over here and they float around over here and they watch you and they float Ooh, it gives me the heebie jeebies a little bit you're in the water and then you go in the water we're in the water with six hours later these guys too you know in fact back when i was at sea world it was all water work you know so it was all you're in a quarter inch wetsuit like all day long did you um i know that there was an accident a few i mean quite a while ago now but did you know the gal that and 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 I don't, if we don't need to discuss this if you don't want to. But what what the heck? What was that? Was it was a whale playing with the girl? Like she he took a lady and brought her way down to the bottom. Okay, well, first, she, unfortunately, I left SeaWorld in 1983, and this okay. I think this, this thing happened in 2009, I believe 2008 or nine, or something like that. It happened a long time ago. Um, I don't know. You know, it's the specifics. I mean, people, get, but what I gathered was that um, the girls, when they work with the, with the whales, they always have their heads back in a, they had it back in a ponytail and she had the ponytail. And I don't know exactly what the deal was, but apparently somebody had, somebody had said something like, I thought that she was um, in the water. It was the one of the whales they didn't, they never went, they didn't go in the water with. They, almost all the whales, they went in the water with the whales. That whale, they didn't go in the water with. 
And I don't know if the whale just thought that her hair was floating on the water was a toy or something. I got grabbed the hair. Okay. When I grabbed the hair, it pulled her in the water. And I don't know what the story is. If the whale was just playing rough with her, I don't know, you know, but I ended up killing her and stuff. And that's basically, and um, my thing is, is that I tell people, I'm just going to tell people that, um, that um, SeaWorld should have said something from the very beginning. They, they, for two years, they just sat there and they didn't say anything at all. And they, you got to say something and you need to, to defend yourself and stuff. And it's just like, and, you know, and I, and I always tell people, listen, if you don't, and I'm not a big fan of killer whales in captivity now as an older person. Now um, I'm not a big fan of, you know, if they don't need to be in captivity, but people need to understand that there was a movie that came out called blackfish after the, after yes. the which was just an absolute farce. I mean, go, I to, the, okay. I go, to, seen it. go to the truth, go to the truth about blackfish and, and it's a breakdown. They break down every scene. Okay. Um, it's not true. I mean, it's like the stuff that they put, they had animal rights activists, who were supposed to be a documentary. Animal rights activists were, were actually hired. They were playing the part of actors in the thing. You know, it's like, that's not a documentary. Um, and they're just, I can just go on and on. There's a ton of stuff. But the, my whole point is this, is that whether you are for animals in captivity or not for animals in captivity, I respect it. They want you to believe that every animal at SeaWorld is plucked out of the ocean and put in shows, okay? The sea lions and dolphins some of those dolphins, those animals are probably 20 generation captive bred animals. You can't release a captive bred into the captive bred animal into the wild. They will die. Okay. Killing food is something that's learned behavior. It's not an instinct. Okay. So they're fed dead fish. Okay. So almost every animal you see performing at SeaWorld in the shows now that now a lot of those whales are captive bred too, and they can't be released into the wild. So they want you to believe that these animals are actually taken from the wild. No, they're not. The animals in SeaWorld, you know, does their best. They 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 pick up beached animals. I, I forget how many, you know, what how many they picked up over the, since their existence. They pick they're they're, be, they're they do their best to pick them up and, and release them in the wild. The last, the last thing they want is take a sea lion or a dolphin and put it back in, you know, have it at their place. They want to be able to release them back in the wild. Um, so I just want people to understand that the animals you see performing in those parks, almost every one of those animals are animals that were captive bred and they were bred, you know. For, and they're helping people learn about the animals and things like that. Yep. And uh, and that's I just want the public to know. Well, and and know too that even in the dog training industry, we deal with animal rights people that like literally don't know what the hell they're talking about. Oh, I know. You know, yeah. and and that's where, like, I know their heart might be in the like in a in a place of where they they believe, but it, it's also uh, an aspect of trying to think with your emotions, right? And we can't do that. And and as somebody that works with dogs every single day, the last thing I ever want to do is hurt an animal. That's well, not the thing is, the animal rights, and I'm very familiar with this because as a movie animal trainer, believe me, they come after us. The yeah. same. But the bottom line is this, is the fact that you just said something really important that is, is for public to understand that um, people get emotional about animals, okay? And there's a word that one of the organizations uses. They say, well... We're going to go after anybody who exploits the animals. Their word of exploiting it, if you're making money off the dog, if you train dogs for seeing eye, hearing impaired, bomb, drugs, police department, you're making money. You're exploiting the animal. They don't want any animal, any animal, movie animal trainers, live shows, no animal. They don't want any animal being exploited. And that's, that's, the, that's, and that's the emotional um, kumbaya you know, world that they live, that they live in. And believe me, I've been on the back, I've been on the backs, backside of these people for a little long. They've yeah. come after you know, a couple different things. And so and I've seen them come after my friends as well, that were um, wild animal trainers too on movies and just totally destroy, um, you know, like, like go after their careers. So yeah, they get salacious, man. And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And, mm -hmm. And it's like, but it's also void of logic. And I don't want anything to do with somebody that is void of logic as well. Void that's, of logic. that's a good, that's good word. When people get emotional and stuff. And it's like, you know, instead of getting emotional, let's get rational. Let's, let's just, let's be rational and understanding about things. So. Yeah. And watch, watch people work, watch the relationship. And that's what we, we started out with is like, look, the cornerstone of everything that we do with these animals is all about rapport relationship. The cornerstone of that relationship is love and honor and respect yeah. and, and knowledge and knowing who this particular animal is as an individual. And, and we're working with the individual at the time 
We're, and I love that that saying of like, you're working with the dog at the end of the leash. Like you're not working with the dog you just worked with as a professional, right? Yeah. Every, every, the characteristics of this individual, their wants and desires are just as important to that individual animal as your wants and desires are to you. And we yeah. are different human beings. Um, and, and that should be respected. And you're right. Absolutely. 100%. When we look at the word respect, it just means to look at again, to take another look. Re is to like reapproach, re yeah. to do again. And then spec, spectare comes from spectacles, right? The glasses, right? So respect is to to take another look. And I just ask people that might feel emotional about this stuff to just kind of take another look at what we do and how we do it and yeah. realize that we've traded our lives to work with animals. And that by itself should show you the scope of um of commitment that we have to understand and to love yeah and some people some people you really can 180 i mean there's a lot of the positive only crowd that have come to my events and i've 180 like i mean if i can if i can get in front of like a lot of these people i, I can 180 like half the people that come that have just this idea of you know the world they live in and once they start li listening to some of the stuff that we that i talk about i mean i can i can turn a lot of these people over to, you know, they become rational, like, you know, what he's saying is rational, what he's saying does make sense, you know, and, uh, but there are some people, that my, my, my point is some people talk to the wall in back of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no reaching them, man. No, well, and, and, but there are the value of planting seeds, and hopefully the seed might germinate someday, and a lot of times that happens when they reach a difficult dog or some case that they, that they really every every aspect of their philosophy has hit a dead end and um and from these interviews i've done hundreds of these interviews now mm -hmm. and a lot of these people that i've talked to that are now professionals happen that happened to them they got a dog that was so difficult maybe it was a blue dog or you know overly fearful or or um or resource guarding or whatnot that wasn't fixed by the positive only methodology and they love this animal <laughs> they don't want to put this animal down they don't want to get rid of this animal they want to figure this out and in doing so they recognize a gap within the industry and they chose to fill it themselves and so now yeah. they're professionals right yeah yeah that's a good yeah that's 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 a good it's a great story it's a great story and so i want to talk about your event how do people get information about your event how do people get tickets um and then are you doing uh working dog or working spots audit spots or 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 um people that mostly dog trainers watch this but uh, people that, that are just there to view it or people that actually bring a dog to work that's what the working spot versus our spot means. Yeah, our our well the events with larry j and i are they're open to everybody so um we'll have i would say probably 90 percent of the people that come or 85 90 percent larry could probably help i know he's still on um i'd say 85 90 percent people are professional dog trainers but we got about 10 or 15 percent that are just the, the general public and we're open to everybody, you know, and, and some of the people that come out, they're not dog trainers. They, they do really, really well. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty cool. So we have basically 12, normally it's 12 working spots for Larry and Jay. I take about 14 to 16 and then the rest are audit spots. And the way we work this thing is that it's, we're in one big room. It's a big ballroom. We do primarily Sheratons because Sheratons are pet friendly, but it's the largest ballroom they have. It's like five, 6,000 square feet. And uh, everything's set up in a big giant U and um, each of us is out for an hour. So everybody watches every session. So I'm out for an hour, Larry's out for an hour, Jay's, and we just alternate, do it that way. So Larry will work with his dogs, Jay will work with his dogs, I'll work with my dogs. We go from seven, or I mean, um, like 8.30 till four, we take a break on Friday and Saturdays, but then we come back from 7.30 to like 10, 10.30. And that's just more, laid back stuff so i'm going to be in my area and we're going to kind of little almost like breakout stuff in the same room so okay. jared Larry will be with his people jay will be with his people i'll be with my people with the dogs and then we come in next morning we just kind of do the same thing again in one hour sessions do it that way um and then for sundays it's nine to one we go straight to one no lunch at all and we finish up at one o'clock so people can get on the way home and it's great you know i'm telling you the thing that's cool about this larry will tell you the same thing and that is that um the people that will come on the very first day on Friday and they're really, really nervous and dogs are barking and whining and they're just like stressed out come Sunday, man, they're all just crashed out. All the dogs are crashed out. And that we always tell people the same thing. We're like, if your dog doesn't even work with any of us, I'll guarantee you come Sunday, 
you're going to be like, this is really, really good. So um, it's pretty good. So anyways, that's what our, that's where our events are. Um, they can go to, they can go to my website, which is joelsilverman.net. Click on um, under workshops. You'll see the um, workshop tour. I also do a film and TV course with my buddy, Brian Renfro, who you should have on sometime. And Brian is up to, he's my mentor, mentor. And he did um, little house in the prayer. That was his very first thing. And I, my very first job I kind of went on. No and, kidding. Uh, yeah. And he's, uh, he goes way, way back. Brian's a Vietnam veteran. He's uh, 75 and he's just, so we do a film and TV course together, which we're doing February, March, and April. We're going to be in San Jose. We're going to be in um, San Jose, Maryland. And we're just going to, we just announced uh, in April, we're going to be here in Fort Myers, Florida, actually. Um, so we do, it's a five day course. And it's for people who want to become movie animal trainers. And it's really, it's, you know, and the reason I set it up is because I've seen so many great dog trainers across the nation. And I'm like, God, they'd be great movie animal trainers. They live in Indianapolis. There's no, there's no competition. So this gives them the opportunity to still do their business, do whatever they're doing, but also be, understand how to set up their own business and train their dogs for movies and commercials and stuff. So. Very cool, man. And I posted up links. I found it on the thing. And here's the, here, I'll show that. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. So you guys click on that. I posted up links for both of them. So this is the one with the five day training course for film and yeah. uh, nice. Brian and, and Joel there. And here we are. Nice. Um, and then rituals. And then if you guys go up here to workshops and then you click right down here, here is the one with Larry and Jay. And I, and I, of course, it's just going to be Larry and Jay on Dallas, but then or Larry and um, Joel on Dallas, but then in Denver. Dallas and St. Louis. Yeah. Dallas and St. Louis. Yeah. But there, there's the guys right there, man. Yeah. Um, and then it's, um, you know, 100% worth it. This is something that uh, I highly, highly recommend doing. And I can't wait to do it myself. And we have tons of, um, of, uh, testimonials here from people all over the the world, all over the dog training industry, and that's what I'm all about too. And that's why I do these these live streams is to to kind of show people like the conversations that I've had with dog trainers from all around the world, and and it, it, you guys can be like a fly on the wall watching this stuff. But I'm all about cooperation, man. We had a lot of competition, and there's that saying. I'm sure you know it. You get three dog trainers in a room. And the only thing that two of them can agree on is that the third one is wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I'm, I don't think so, man. I think that we can have harmony. I think that we can figure some stuff out, especially if we have a nice, a wonderful network of, of professionals that we can tap into, because at the end of the day, I believe we're all in this for the dogs. Well, yeah. And, and the thing is, I think what happens is people have just got to put their egos aside, you know, um, Larry J and I are, you know, we're very much the same, but, but our tactics, how we deal with situations are different. And, you know, it's like, we all respect each other. And like, I mean, we were for like four years and there's nothing we've ever looked at. We are like, well, I don't think that's right at all. We, we've never done that at all. It's just because we just understand. It's like, Hey, you know what? That works for him. You know? And it's like, that's all that matters. You know, is dog an animal happy? Is the animal happy? Yeah. Is he learning? Yeah. Is the style you, 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 different than you? Yeah, but it's okay. So we have no problem with that at all. And we've never had a problem. We've never, you know, and, and we just, you know, matter of fact, there's things that Larry does that I start to do a little bit. Matter of fact, play the play stuff. That you do. <laughs> I do play. too, man. That's oh, so I, have, I have a Havanese, the little guy on, on rituals and the cover of rituals, right? my dog, my dog, Oliver. He's a Havanese. I mean, I've got him into play now and he's just so into his, he's got his little giraffe thing that he tugs with and stuff. But I learned it all through Jay, you know? So, um, so we all learn, you know, you, you learn from each other as well. So, so. what's the steal your dog remember that 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 blew my mind yeah. man i was like oh dude this is i'm all about the steal your dog where where you have another person trying to entice your dog away or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll talk about that with jay when he comes over i've, I've attended all three years in st louis to plan on next year as well oh. great learning experience oh, cool we look forward to seeing you in january well, and and um, we, there's so much more we could talk about, but I want to uh, I want to thank you for your time today, Joel. And um, I would love to tap you in the future about maybe talking about your collar and some other aspects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love, I love doing this. I I could do this all day long. I could do it all day long. I just really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much. And then um, if you want to stay there, I'll say goodbye to you in the studio, Joel. But let's say goodbye to everybody and and thank you all for watching and and uh, let let us know if you have any questions for the next time Joel and I speak. And uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate it. Bye.